at the Yekaterinburg plant, the first ingot was cast from tantalum powder, a unique material without which electronics, nuclear reactors, space rockets, and weapons cannot be produced. Right now, a brutal war is being fought over this metal in the African Democratic Republic of the Congo. How are these events connected, and what do the Wagner Group, Kazakhstan, and nationalization in Russia have to do with it? Let's break down this intense story, and we'll also share a new rescue story after a brief summary of positive news. The Soyuz 2-1.1 a launch vehicle with the crewed spacecraft Soyuz Mission Series, 25 successfully launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Production of Yerofei tactical all-terrain vehicles has been expanded in Khabarovsk and Burlak all-terrain vehicles in the Kurgan region. Rosatom has launched mass production of 3D printers for printing with metal powder composites. The Rose Electronica Holding Company has started mass production of a line of control modules for unmanned systems. In Engels, after the departure of foreign companies, the production of industrial spark plugs for industrial engines has been resumed. The United Engine Corporation has launched a new supercomputer for creating digital twins of aircraft engines. The Stakhanov Carriage Works in the Luhansk People's Republic has produced its first 145 rail cars. Sewing production has resumed in Melitopol and a food production facility has opened in Mordovia. The first 8 kilogram ingot made from tantalum powder has been smelted in the furnace of the Yekaterinburg non-ferrous metals processing plant. This, which may seem like an uninteresting industry event to the average person, is actually part of an exciting, tragic, but at the same time encouraging story for us, which we will tell you about. Let's start with the fact that tantalum is a rare metal, one of the most important materials for the microelectronics industry, whose properties allow it to be used in chips as a barrier between silicon and copper. Tantalum is also used in metallurgy, the nuclear and chemical industries, and in the production of weapons. The metal is considered strategic because its reserves are limited and could be depleted on Earth within the next hundred years. Based on this, countries that are fortunate enough to have such wealth on their territory should prosper, but sometimes wealth becomes a curse. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, or Democratic Republic of the Congo, is a country in Central Africa with a population of 112 million people and the largest cobalt reserves in the world. It has the largest reserves on the continent of tantalum, diamonds, uranium, tungsten, copper, zinc, tin, and other resources, without which the modern global economy would not exist. But despite all this, the Democratic Republic of the Congo remains one of the poorest countries in the world, simply because all this wealth does not belong to it. The Democratic Republic of the Congo used to be a colony of Belgium. The Belgians didn't know about tantalum yet, so they extracted rubber and ivory, brutally suppressing any attempts at protest by the local population. In 1960, the well-known Congolese patriot to every Soviet citizen, Patrice Lumumba, led the national movement and achieved real independence for the Republic of Congo, becoming a symbol of the anti-colonial movement for all of Africa. However, soon Western intelligence agencies kidnapped, tortured, and brutally killed Patrice A., a former Belgian police commissioner, in the best traditions of the so-called civilized West, even took a gold tooth from the deceased as a souvenir. Since then, Congo has not seen peace. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, while formally independent, has had its resources bought up cheaply by foreigners, reflecting modern colonization methods. The local people manually extract valuable metals literally for food. The black market smuggling, child labor, and crime are thriving. In fact, all modern digital technologies are paid for by the tragedy of an entire nation. And recently, war has broken out here again. Right now, the M23 rebel movement has taken control of a significant part of the mines 
and is attacking cities in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, pushing government forces back toward the capital. The Western press is sounding the alarm. Supply chains have been disrupted and the global economy could be left without tantalum. This alarm is hypocritical. You should know that some time ago, the Americans sold control over many of the Democratic Republic of the Congo as resources to the Chinese. After that, out of nowhere, an entire army of militant rebels appeared, armed to the most modern NATO standards, and seized key deposits. There is no doubt that Tantalum and other resources will continue to flow to Western countries only through the black market. The M23 rebels are proxy forces of neighboring Rwanda, which has very close ties with the United Kingdom. In Africa, they are called competitors of the Russian Wagner Group, which has already succeeded in pushing Westerners out of many countries on the continent. Only M23, as we can see, acts in completely opposite interests. The conflict that has erupted in the Democratic Republic of the Congo has every chance of drawing neighboring countries into it. Russia signed a military cooperation agreement with the Republic at the beginning of March, but it's unlikely that we, like the Western countries, will openly intervene in what's happening. Africa is being swept by its own wave of hybrid wars, and all sorts of proxy groups funded by foreigners will continue to fight here for resources for a long time. That makes it even more interesting to find out where we ourselves can get Tantalum so we don't have to dive headfirst into this bloodbath. Thanks to our ancestors for our land, there's plenty of Tantalum stored in it, at least more than enough for our own needs. The deposits are situated in Murmansk region, eastern Siberia, Transbaikalia, and Yakutia. Having underground resources isn't enough. You must know how to extract, process, and turn them into a product. In the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, we had the necessary technologies. But after its collapse, the key link was lost. The Ulba metallurgical plant remained on the territory of Kazakhstan, and even today, it is one of the largest producers of uranium, beryllium, and tantalum products. That's why, from the ore mined in Russia, we extracted tantalum oxide, sent it to Kazakhstan, and received back tantalum powders and ingots, from which we then produced the final product. Recent events have shown that you can never have too much technological independence, and it's important to be able to process rare metals ourselves. So work has begun on restoring production. Let's get back to the main news. The Solacombs Magnesium Plant, together with the Yekaterinburg Non-Ferrous Metals Processing Plant, has produced the first experimental 8 kilogram ingot from tantalum powder. This is part of the process of restoring the complete production chain in the country from ore mining to ingot manufacturing. Now there is no doubt that we are capable of this and we don't need to compete with the Americans and the Chinese for the resources of the unfortunate Congolese. We will be able to provide for ourselves without wars, intrigues, or deception. It's interesting that this story has another important aspect. The mentioned Solikamsk magnesium plant was returned from the hands of the oligarch to the state by a court decision in 2022. The plant provides 100% of the domestic production of niobium and tantalum compounds and 75% of magnesium. This is just part of the extensive but quiet process of nationalizing the most important industries. In March, the Kelyabinsk electro-metallurgical plant returned to state ownership, accounting for about 80% of the markets and alloys. 